Uh, my name is Don Farish. I'm the president at Roger Williams University, which is located in two places, Bristol and then across the street. Um, the across the street part is still a work in progress, but we'll be moving in in early May, and we anticipate um, in this larger facility that we'll have to be able to do even more of these kind, kinds of partnerships with both the Providence Public Library and many other organizations in, in Providence. So this is a, a bit of a maiden voyage for us right now, but we're, we're very pleased with how things have gone to date. So, got a few things I need to uh, avoid forgetting, so I've got my notes with me. Um, so first of all, for the, uh, the past year and a half, Roger Williams University has um, been regularly convening conversations uh, about civil rights past and present. It's really part of the 150th um, anniversary of the, uh, the signing of the, of the 13th Amendment. And uh, that's now coming to an end. Um, and this is pretty much the last event. But we've learned in the process that this work never ends. And so it, a lot of things are still going to be going forward. Um, just last week, the university down in Bristol hosted a symposium titled Black Lives, uh, Activism in the Past and Present. And I'm really proud to, to say that that whole event was catalyzed and organized in large part by members of our student body. Uh, they, they did work with faculty uh, and university staff, but, but it was really their initiative, and, and I'm really proud of the work that they're doing. Collectively, the university is guided by a new core purpose that we uh, came up with just last year, and that core purpose is to strengthen society through engaged teaching and learning. And this idea of strengthening society we think is terribly important. How do, how do we make a mark as an institution through the people who populate the university to make the world a better place? And the world in this case starts with Rhode Island, uh, where we are located, but it doesn't end with Rhode Island. But while we're here in Rhode Island, it's important that we feel that we're moving the dial uh, in a positive way. The issues that matter to society are therefore the issues that matter to us. And more importantly, thoughtful conversations about race in America are clearly conversations that need to be had. And we've seen that over the, through the Black Lives Matter movement over the last year or more. We're seeing conversations bring, uh, sometimes happening spontaneously in university campuses. And we're reminded all the time that even 50 years after the Selma to Montgomery March, that there's still an awful lot of work to be done. And that Selma to Montgomery March, by the way, for those of you um, who haven't been in the library in uh, recent months, is commemorated through uh, the work of a remarkable photographer who was a college student himself at the time, who was on that march and taking photographs of people who would be very familiar to you, such as Martin Luther King, but in images that for the most part have never been seen before. So if you have the time after we're done tonight, um, the library's open until 8.30, I, I really urge you to take 15 minutes, or however long you want, um, just to see those images, because it's, it's history in America. It's right there. And uh, familiar to those of us uh, old enough for it to be familiar, uh, perhaps new to some of our younger members, but very much uh, an important, really a, a seminal event in the history of this country. I want to say, before we get started, I want to say thanks to a few uh, key individuals who made tonight's event possible. And, and first, we, I, I've got to recognize uh, Bank of America. They are the, our corporate sponsors tonight. We would have a very difficult time pulling this off without them. So, in, in particular, and here tonight is, uh, is, is Bill Hatfield, who's the president of uh, Bank of America, Rhode Island. And Bill, I've lost you. Where You're here somewhere. There you are. OK, Bill, uh, that, that's the guy. So he, he, he made this possible. So, as you go by on the way out, just, um, I don't know, fill out a bank deposit or something. Just, <laughs> just open an account. That would be good. Um, and um, uh, the uh, vice president for um, enterprise business and community engagement, uh, Sandra Jess, is also here. And I, I, they've really been great to work with. Uh, I want to also acknowledge um, and thank uh, the Providence Public Library through its executive director, Jack Martin. Um, we really appreciate uh, working with Jack. Jack, stand up. <laughs> uh, e even as we were looking for a new downtown location, we, we met Jack as he, 
as he arrived in town. And uh, he's been right from the very beginning, just a terrific guy to work with. And we look forward to lots of collaborations because across the street in One Empire Plaza, we don't have a room like this. So we may want to prevail on Jack to help us out occasionally when we need to get some, a crowd together. Um, Jack worked with us a lot on the, uh, on the Freedom Journey exhibit that I referred to a moment ago, and, and uh, it was great working with Jack and his staff to put that together. Um, and I know that many, many people in Rhode Island have had a chance to see those photographs, and, and we think that's all for the good. So, so thanks again, Jack. As we look um, forward to the, the culmination of both Freedom Journey, it's the exhibit, and, uh, and Black History Month, uh, which uh, is February, it's critical that we continue to have thoughtful conversations about race in America as we engage in the tremendously important work toward achieving racial equality in the United States. And, and we at Roger Williams University are committed to facilitating those discussions well into the future. In fact, in just a few weeks, um, sort of shout out to our students here, at five o'clock on March 16th in the Global Heritage Hall Auditorium, this is intended for the campus people here, but I said I would do this. Four student organizations will host a forum called Justice in the Classroom. And the intent here is to create an opportunity for students to share instances of classroom and non-classroom bias interaction with faculty and staff in an effort to encourage those groups to be more conscious of these issues and to take steps to address them. And I encourage all the faculty, staff, and students here and back on our Bristol campus to attend. It's, it's important we engage in these kinds of discussions in a proactive way and not wait for things to force us to be responding more defensively. So the more that we can do to be up front on these issues, the better off all of us will be served. And now to introduce the, uh, the panelists for the evening, I'd like to welcome Wilbert Hicks. Uh, Will is the Assistant Vice President of Global Corporate Accounts Payable at Bank of America Rhode Island and Chairperson of the Bank of America's Black Professional Group in Rhode Island um, and he's the recipient of the Bank of America 2015 Diversity and Inclusion Award. So please join me in welcoming Wilbert Hicks. Hello, everybody. I'd like to thank Don. And on behalf of Bank of America, I want to say how proud we are to be partnering with these partners here and hosting this event. I think it's just a remarkable thing that we are allowed to do this. And I want to thank Bill Hatfield and Sean Dadges as well for allowing my organization to be a part of such a great event. Can I make sure I don't forget anything you do? I got my notes. One of the things that President Ferris noted, which was very important, is that we must always remember and reflect back on our history. It's very important for the folks who were here and maybe of a vintage age to remember and live through it but it's also important that the children that we educate today understand that we're not just, and they're not just growing up on their own. They're standing on the shoulders of giants who paved the way for you to have the ability to be where you're at today. With that being said, I'd like to introduce our two speakers for today. Joining us tonight to continue this conversation is Ed Fitzpatrick and Jim Vincent. Ed Fitzpatrick is a Providence Journalist columnist whose race in Rhode Island series has stirred lively debates throughout the ocean state. Earlier this year, Ed traveled to Alabama with former president of the Providence NAACP, Cliff Montero, on the 50th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March, which I hope he talks about and gives us some detail on. Joining Ed in leading this discussion in this event is the current Providence NAACP president, Jim Vincent. Jim is the recipient of the Rhode Island Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Commission's Living the Dream Award and also serves as president of the East Bay Communication Action Program and the Rhode Island Affirmative Action Professionals, in addition to serving on the boards of a number of Rhode Island organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, this is sure to be a captivating conversation. Please join me in welcoming Ed and Jim.
thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, seems like we're just here. It was December 9th, uh, this exhibit opened, and uh, we had uh, the former chairman of the Providence branch of the NAACP, Cliff Montero, here, uh, who is Jim's mentor. And uh, I had gone down to Selma with Cliff uh, 50 years to the day after he'd walked over the Edmund Pettus Bridge with Martin Luther King, and it was quite an experience, quite an honor, and to see him uh, relive all the emotions of 50 years ago and, and to talk about uh, what's changed since then and what needs to change still. Um, so I've got 20 questions here for Jim. That's all? <laughs> Give or take. And, uh, and, and then we're going to open up to a Q&A. Uh, so be thinking of the questions uh, you want to bring afterwards. Um, but if you haven't seen the exhibit, by the way, it, it's, uh, it's here through Sunday. Uh, and it's open until 8.30 tonight. I highly recommend it. I, I got to see it through Cliff Montero's eyes, and, and, and Stephen Summerstein uh, brings a whole new perspective to it, too. Captured a lot of the moment. And uh, Jim, I was wondering what, uh, to begin with, what um, struck you the most about the exhibit? Well, before I talk about the exhibit, I'd like to thank Roger Williams University, Bank of America, the Providence uh, Public Library. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to a very dear friend of mine, Anna Connor Morales of the Roger Williams University. The Tino Policy Institute does great work out here, so thanks for coming, Anna. Uh, what struck me was the, the earnestness in the faces of the people. You could see that they were very determined in terms of seeking freedom, uh, that they had endured enough, and they were going to do something about it. Now, the faces in the crowd were different, of course. Uh, I was struck by uh, the number of white people that were on the march, people that were from the clergy, other interested people, students, that also felt that enough was enough and that something had to change in this country. So too often, I think people forget that you know, these marches were very integrated marches. It wasn't just black people. There were all kinds of people. So, how, how old were you at the time? OK, I guess I have to give it up now. I was 13 years old at the time. And uh, that's the other thing that struck me, uh, the fact that there were so many people and so many kids in the, in the pictures, 12, 13, 14, my age. Uh, I was living comfortably in the city of Boston, uh, relatively com comfortably, comfortably in Boston, so I could relate to it. It wasn't something from another era. It was in my lifetime. You know, I, I, I definitely could tell that it was not that long ago because of the fact that some of those kids that were in that picture probably went to college with me. They just didn't, uh, they just didn't say that much about it. And uh, the other thing, is that unlike Emmett Till, who would have been 74 or 10 years older than me, I'm, re I'm basically the same age of the, as the four girls that were in Birmingham that uh, were you know, bombed uh, that, uh, that morning, that Sunday morning, at Sunday school practice. So, so you know, I, that struck me too. Those girls would be my age now if they had lived. Yeah, that that mo march led to the passage of the Voting Rights Act. So, how far have we come in those 50 years, and, and, and what is the biggest challenge regarding voting rights now in America? Well, you know, we, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, of course, was a landmark decision uh, by the Supreme Court. However, the Supreme Court just made another decision a couple of years ago to gut uh, preclearance. So, you know, uh, there's a good chance that a lot of the good work that was done by so many is going to be unraveled. I don't think it's a secret that there's an effort in this country to roll back voting rights. Uh, uh, before Barack Obama was elected president, about two states had restrictive voting laws. Right now, there's about 32 states that have introduced restrictive voting laws. So there's an all-out effort to roll back voting rights across this country, and it's really disturbing. Yeah, you're talking there about the case, the 2013 case, Shelby County versus Holder. And in the majority decision, the Chief Justice John Roberts wrote that our country has changed. While any racial discrimination in voting is too much, Congress must ensure that the legislation it passes to remedy that problem speaks to current conditions. Uh, so what do you make of that? Have conditions changed sufficiently? Well, sure. You know, conditions have changed. I mean, we don't have uh, uh, people riding in the back of the bus. We don't have white and colored only. And we don't have a number of things uh, uh, like we had back in the 50s and the 60s, but things haven't changed enough. We still have a lot of problems with race in this country. So, so John Roberts, you know, the Chief Justice, has a part right, things have changed, but what he doesn't understand is that they haven't changed enough. 
and it hasn't changed enough to gut the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And what did you make of the dissent from uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg? She said, throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory, discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. I think, uh, I think she hit the ball out of the park with that comment. Uh, that, that, that's a good way to put it. Um, I think with the, uh, some of the members of the Supreme Court that, that voted you know, to block preclearance, 5-4 decision, what they don't understand is that you know, it's because of the Voting Rights Act that we had the progress that we had in this country. You know, and, and, and it just didn't happen magically. It was because of things like preclearance, pre because you know, the states would have done what they're doing now. You know, uh, eliminating uh, same-day voting and early voting and, and making it as tough for people as possible to vote in, in, in this presidential election. All right. Do you have any hope of getting the umbrella back? You know, is, is the, the Supreme Court's 4-4 four four right now, is, is it a, something we're going to see through a judicial route, or is there a legislative fix that you think is feasible? Well, I'm going to answer it two ways. One, uh, President Barack Obama has a responsibility, a responsibility to nominate somebody for that Supreme Court this year, this year. He has a responsibility to do it. And the US Senate has a responsibility to act on it. Now, they don't have to accept anybody, but you, have, you cannot say, uh, I'm not gonna accept anybody. I mean, that's, that's the height of uh, being irresponsible as far as I'm concerned. You know, for a party that you know, talks a lot about you know, the Constitution, it just really is disingenuous to now look the other way in terms of what you know, the Constitution says is the responsibility of the President of the United States. So I think that, however, uh, there is gonna be a, a justice named, and it's gonna be named, uh, if not this year, it's gonna be next year. And uh, I think whoever that justice is, is probably gonna be probably more predisposed to uh, putting back preclearance than not. Uh, I'm, maybe it's more wishful thinking on my part, but the way, the way it looks today, to me, I think the next justice is going to uh, reverse that 5-4. So you see, look into the courts as opposed to Congress to fix that. Um, yeah, I think I, right now I definitely look to the courts. Uh, I also think that the states also can do the, what they can do. I know here in Rhode Island, uh, Secretary of State Nellie Gobert has some, some legislation in terms of making voting easier. And I think that there has been at least 24 states that have also passed laws to make voting easier. So we need more of that to counteract those states that are making voting harder. So, well, yeah, after, after uh, the Supreme Court decision, many states passed laws, voter ID, other things, putting re new restrictions that weren't in place before. Rhode Island, well, some, many were red states. One was a deep blue state known as Rhode Island, and we passed voter ID. It, I was just speaking with the author of a book called Give Us the Ballot, Ari Berman, and he said Rhode Island's a bit of a head scratcher. How do you explain, so how do you explain that? Uh, it's very difficult to explain that, uh, because that is a head scratcher. I mean, uh, I, I, you know, I don't know what to make of it. I mean, I think that there, is, there were some people that thought it was a good government thing to do, to, to have photo ID. They did no, no due diligence. They didn't, they didn't know who that would affect negatively because if they did any kind of study or survey in terms of the people it would impact, then they wouldn't have done it. They just wouldn't have done it. It could have been irresponsible to do that. You, when you're going to make thing, voting harder for uh, people of color, for the homeless, for the poor, for the elderly, for students, you're going to do something without any evidence of on-site voter fraud whatsoever, and then you go out and pass a law, uh, that's the height of irresponsibility as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you know, usually you have to have reams of evidence to pass laws, not anecdotal evidence that doesn't happen to be uh, substantiated. And, and, and you do you, all kinds of studies to kind of figure out who's going to benefit, who's going to be hurt, and to not have done any of that uh, smacks at just, uh, you know, some fears, fears of maybe the increasing Latino vote, for example. You know, I've heard that as a theory. Uh, you have uh, uh, other theories that uh, there's a cordial, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a feeling among the General Assembly to kind of help each other pass laws when you think it's not uh, any big deal. So I think there was some of that, you know, helping certain reps get what they want. You know, it didn't seem to be onerous at the time. Uh, so you have some of that, and it just uh, was just poor, poor thinking. It just, you know, we're just going to do it because it sounds good. You know, it, it, it was unbelievable. I know the NAACP and a lot of other groups 
fought tooth and nail so that we wouldn't have photo id here but unfortunately we're not successful in the secretary of state at time ralph mollis was arguing that well it's different than the voter id laws in other states there's more forms of id how do you respond to that i would i told him what i told him once i said that's like taking a test and i'm bragging because i got a 58 and the other person got a 30 and you need a 60 to pass you know failure is failure you know i don't care if i got a 58 or a 28 you know just because it looks less onerous in rhode island and that it's the best of a bad situation the best of a bad situation that's nothing to celebrate you know the whole thing shouldn't have happened in the first place and to say you're not as bad as other places you're not as bad uh that to me is ridiculous and i think he should have really looked at that look a little more closer before he before he uh he did that and maybe he would still be in public office today Are there any, uh, the legislative session's underway, are there any uh, proposals coming forward to modify or even repeal voter ID? Not that I know of. Uh, you know, the, the, the thing that really is, is, is a sticking point is the photo part of photo ID. I think people find that you have to have, having some identification is reasonable enough, but the, the, the fact is not everybody has a photo and not everybody can easily get that photo. Not everybody has a passport or a driver's license or should they need to have to have it if they choose not to live with it. I mean, I, I have a driver's license. My, my passport expired, and I'm sure I'll renew it, but that's my choice. Uh, you have to look at the impact, how it's impacting people. Voting is a right. It's not a privilege. It's not like cashing a check at a liquor store or taking a trip to Paris. That's a privilege, and you need ID to do that. Voting is a fundamental right. People fought, bled, and died for the right to vote. So it's very serious, very different, and we stop playing with rights, fundamental rights, you know, as if, as if you know, it's something that, you know, can just be turned on and off. I think it's just dangerous. You noted that, and Rick Hassan uh, has written about how it's very, very rare for in-person voter fraud to uh, sway an election. Uh, it's much easier to steal an election with mail ballots. Yet at the same time we were passing vote ID here in Rhode Island, we're also making it easier to use mail ballots. How do you explain that, and what's been the impact of that? That's another head scratcher. You know, it's, it's much easier to commit voter fraud by mail ballots. So what do we do in Rhode Island? We made it easier. It's much more difficult to, to, to commit fraud in terms of in-person voting. So what do we do? We made it harder. So it's time, <laughs> the two things don't make sense. However, uh, you know, there is fraud in terms of mail ballots. So I think uh, the Secretary of State has a, a bill that's going to help with that. I think uh, the problem there is that too many hands are involved in, in the current system. Uh, and I think that needs to be restricted because there's too much, uh, too much uh, that can go wrong when you have just anybody handling a mail ballot. So um, I know that uh, maybe in certain states, uh, mail ballots never talked about because it affects military people more or the elderly more, and maybe they don't want to get into that fight. But you know, fair is fair. If it's, if it's fraud in mail ballots, and let's make sure that that doesn't happen. If there's no fraud in in-person uh, voting, then then let's not talk about fraud when you really, what you really want to do is keep certain people from voting, and we all know who they are. I don't know if there's any state legislators here, but if there are, if the legislature's listening, what's the most important thing the General Assembly can do this session regarding voting rights? Pass Secretary of State Snelly Gorbea's legislation. She has three bills, pass those. And if uh, somebody in the legislature wants to repeal voter ID and a group of people think that's a good idea, then, that, then I'd support that too. I don't see that happening, but I think uh, you know, that photo part of photo ID uh, uh, or the photo ID part of the you know, identification just needs to go. And what's the secretary proposes in it? Online voter registration? Right, online voter registration, I think, uh, uh, same day voter registration, I think, and then also some reforms in terms of absentee ballots, which, uh, which are needed. Um, so, yeah, 50 years have passed since the Voting Rights Act passed. Um, uh, but a basic question about voting rights just came before the Supreme Court in the case of Ebenwell versus Abbott. The justices are going to decide what the court meant when it established that principle of one person, one vote. You know, should voting districts have the same number of people or the same number of eligible voters? Well, the court meant uh, the same number of people because if you remember, uh, down south, they were trying to increase the, the numbers of people so they decided to count their property as three-fifths of a human being, if you remember. And those were the slaves. They were counting them as three-fifths of a human being for the purposes of voting. 
uh, in terms of not voting, but in terms of, in terms of the voting uh, jurisdiction. So it's always been about population, not about eligible voters. And I think um, uh, it's probably better to keep it uh, in terms of the population versus eligible voters because there's certain populations that are younger, they have bigger families, and they would be more disenfranchised than other populations. So it's just a slippery slope. You know, do we look at uh, different groups that have bigger families, younger families, and, and, and say that you're, you shouldn't be voting or you're, you shouldn't have as much power as other people because they have smaller families or they have older families? No, I think, um, I think that's not uh, the way to go. Let me ask you about a couple of matters that have been in the headlines recently. Uh, of, of just the other day, 50 Providence College students uh, staged a 13-hour sit-in at the, the President uh, Shanley's office to protest what they called anti-blackness and racism on campus. And the President agreed to make progress and issue a comprehensive plan by March 7th. Uh, can you tell us more about what sparked that pro protest and what you think of the college's response? Well, in general, it's, it was sparked by uh, what was perceived to be inaction by the administration at Providence College in terms of the demands of students, or, the, or the, not the demands then, but the concerns. They go back years or even decades about racial profiling on campus and insensitivity of professors on campus, uh, lack of uh, curriculum that meets all the needs of students in a, in a diverse society, different things that have been talked about over the years that really fell on deaf ears. Uh, we have a chapter on that campus, uh, NAACP being the way, and so we are a little more closer to it than a lot of the people. What kind of really spurred action, I think, is the, uh, what happened about a month ago. Uh, five African-American uh, students, uh, females, were trying to get into an off-campus party, and they were told, uh, we don't want your kind here, you people. Uh, go back to where you came from. And, you know, they, they said, well, okay, we have a girlfriend who is really light skin. I guess they thought that she might have been white. They let her in. We want to go get her to, so that we can keep going. You know, we don't need to be in your party, I guess. Um, so they um, basically, um, you know, had some people upstairs that were going to dump some water on them, allegedly. And then I heard uh, that uh, even beer bottles were thrown at them, or water bottles, bottles were thrown at them and missing one uh, very close to her head. So after that incident, there was a meet, big meeting on campus, and I got wind of that incident, and I said, well, let me have the five uh, students meet with me and the police chief and the NAACP executive me, let's see what can happen. So I also said, I want, I want to have a meeting with Father Shanley. And I got that meeting, and he assured me that, you know, uh, uh, he was going to investigate that incident. He was going to hire a special attorney to do that and have his campus you know, uh, apparatus look into the incident. I told them that that was good and that I also uh, was working with the Providence Police. And I said, I also thought because of what was said and then the assault in terms of throwing out the bottle, I said, I got some friends that I want to investigate it. They're called the Federal Bureau of Investigation. So I called my friends uh, to investigate this, then the FBI. And um, so I said, that we'll keep contact. We'll see how that goes. Um, what I wanted to do is meet with some of the professors and some of the students and try to get a meeting with Father Shanley so that we could talk about these demands. But before we could even do that, the students took over the office and, 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 and forced the issue and, and, got, and got the meeting that they wanted to talk about the demands, which I feel are reasonable. Talking about curriculum, talking about multicultural center, a diversity officer, things that seem very reasonable to, to I think, most people. Yeah, what, what's the most important thing that you hope comes out of that? I hope that uh, there's an action plan in terms of the demands. The, uh, Father Shanley said he is going to put together an action plan and meet with the students on March 7th. He's going to look at each one, each item individually, put together some kind of plan of action around that, uh, have student input, and, 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 have it, um, and have a good talk on March 7th. But I think a lot of this could have been avoided if that talk or that discussion would have happened maybe a year ago. You know, they, when the students first brought it up, if he would have said, okay, let's meet with the students, let's have a task force, let's do something. Uh, then it wouldn't have came down to a takeover of his office for 13 hours. Uh, the students were exacerbated because they couldn't get a meeting. And uh, they just said, you know, we, we don't know what else to do. We've we, we got to have this meeting. we got to have this discussion. So we're going to do this. A couple of months ago, the town of Johnston denied the King's Tabernacle Church approval to use a 124-year-old church as a second place of worship uh, for the congregation. And the pastor... Uh, said the town said no because he and his congregation are primarily black. The pastor cited a recording 
in, in which a building official refers to him as an expletive black owner of the church. So what's the latest on that episode, and, and what does it tell you? Well, the, the very latest just happened about an hour ago. Uh, there was an anonymous letter that had, uh, you know, uh, we don't want you N-words here in Charleston and whatever. But I, 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 I told the, the folks that I, I work with, let's be cautious about that. It was an anonymous letter. You don't know who put that together. Um, let's, let's have a wait and see. I, I, I told my people to uh, let the police chief know, let the mayor know, and, um, and you probably will see it in Go Local tomorrow as well. well actually, Go Local now. Uh, just happened about an hour ago, uh, so that's the very latest. But what happened was that they, um, the the church people went to a zoning hearing, and I guess uh, they needed to work certain things out in order to move into this abandoned church. So it's a church going into a church. But the way they were treated at the zoning board, they felt that they didn't get any 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 you know inter interaction by the, the zoning people. That the hearing lasted less than five minutes that it, they just kind of looked at the people and kind of just said denial. They just felt that they weren't treated with respect and dignity. So it was more the attitude, I think, of the zoning officials. There might have been some things that needed to be done, but when you just look at somebody and just say deny and very little conversation, it takes five minutes, everybody was kind of like, what happened? Usually a zoning hearing, if you have somebody that comes before the, the, the board, there's maybe 15, 20, 25 minutes of discussion back and forth, and, and then there's either a decision or there's there's some counsel in terms of what needs to be done, but not, you know, looking at people in five minutes. So they kind of felt something was not right with that. And then the building inspector, that was that was another incident where, you know, they were they had already purchased the property and they were trying to do some work and they had had a, a bad encounter with the building inspector. So when they were to meet with the building inspector a second time, they decided to record him. And in, the re in recording him, uh, the building inspector unfortunately came out with you, you black this, that, and the other, and it kind of confirmed to them, the church people, that you know, there might be some real racial problems in Johnston. So, what's happened since then is that uh, uh, the mayor has suspended the building inspector uh, for 30 days. Uh, he also has to do diversity training, and uh, so that so that was an action in terms of what the response to the building inspector, and what. We thought was going to happen because I had a meeting with the mayor with some of the other community leaders. We thought that the attorneys, the city solicitor and, and, and the church attorneys were going to try to work something out. But I guess the church was so exasperated by just everything that they hired another attorney to file a federal lawsuit because they felt that the Rhode Island law, you know, that prohibited a church from going into church because I guess the, the church was abandoned for a year. And I guess now you have to go through, you know, the same thing you would go through if the church you were we're going into was a, a factory or something, a different kind of use. Uh, it's Rhode Island law, and uh, I guess they're saying that that law might be unconstitutional because of the fact that you deal with the church. So there's a federal lawsuit, and I don't know when that's going to be resolved. And, then, and they're not in the church. And they're not, they're not in the church. I wanted to ask you about an editorial that was in this Sunday's New York Times. It noted that in Los Angeles and New York City, about 30% of the 20 to 24-year-old black men were out of work or out of school in 2014. And the situation was even worse in Chicago, where nearly half of the black men in that age group were neither working nor in school. So the editorial argued that the country should have, should have stuck with the unemployment subsidy program that was passed as part of the Recovery Act in 2009, subsidizing jobs. And so what do you see as the solution to the high those kinds of high unemployment levels uh, that you see throughout the nation, but also here in Rhode Island? Well, it's, it's the complete marginalization of people of color. I mean, it's much deeper than just the subsidy program. I mean, I, where do you begin? I mean, you, you, have, in, you have schools that are, uh, are not on a par of what people deserve in terms of the facility to the faculty, the, the instruction. You, you have to have people that get the same kind of education as anybody gets. You know, so the disparity in what kids get is, is, is part of the problem. And this whole thing of school to prison pipeline, when Kids are getting suspended three, four, five times more than their peers for the same thing. And then people want to say, well, maybe it's because of poverty. And then you say, well, well how do you explain Barrington and East Greenwich uh, uh, suspending black kids in higher proportions than Providence and Central Falls? How do you explain that? Because those kids go to school hungry in Barrington and East Greenwich, those, those lawyers and doctors, those parents that don't feed their kids. So, you know, it, it's, it's deeper than that. It's, it's basically based on race, I feel. And uh, that proves it in terms of having a higher suspension rate 
in the suburbs of the cities but even there is this is beyond even that it's just a true tional it's some of the parents you know they 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 can't get jobs because of discrimination or because they don't have the kind of skills that people that that are young that have that are old enough don't have the right skills for the new economy so you have to have skilled training uh... it's a whole host of things i think segregation uh... it's 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 got to be worked on in a comprehensive fashion but we have to agree that you know we still have a lot of problems with race it's not it doesn't explain everything but it explains too much of it and if we don't come to grips with the fact that we have a racial problem still in this country in two thousand sixteen then nothing will change identifies uh... three hate groups here in rhode island including the militant knights of the ku klux klan should that come as a surprise to rhode islanders uh... i think it is a surprise to most rhode islanders but but those groups are in every state uh... you know uh, they're in every state and and they're growing uh... the southern poverty law center says they're growing rapidly you, you, you have people in this country they're in fear they're anxious they, they don't know what's going on with the country they want their country back you know they you know they say things so you you, you know the natural reaction to some of that is to, to have groups of people that want to you know change you know things for, to bring it back to where they used to be back in the days of Ozzie and Harriet and Leave It to Beaver and those kinds of days you know but we're not going back to those days those days are over I like those shows but we're not going back we're not going back can't go back we gotta go forward so um you know, to the extent that those groups haven't done anything really crazy here in Rhode Island, I, I thank God for that. But uh, It's tied to some of the flyers we've seen in East Greenwich um, on the east side of Providence? Possibly, possibly. I'm, I'm always cautious with that because you never know. I mean, it could be some, some kids, but, you know, it could be, could be them. I mean, I don't know. Nobody really knows. I know there's been some investigation, but it, nothing conclusive. But uh, it, we should be concerned. You know, there are people that are anxious and they're looking for scapegoats and looking for people to blame for their own situations. And... You know, they're in denial you know, in, in, in large part in terms of things that are really going on. So uh, we have to be careful out here. Key member of the uh, sounding board for last year's Race in Rhode Island series that the Providence Journal did. And, and, uh, I, and one of the highlights of the series was John Hill reported on uh, the criminal justice system that blacks account for 5% of Rhode Island's general population, but they make up 30.6% of the people at the ACI and 20.2% of the people on probation and parole. So talk to us about what accounts for that disparity and, and, and what we can do about it. Well, you know, it's a little bit of, a little bit of poverty, a little bit of racism, um, a little bit of failure in terms of uh, acknowledging the fact that, you know, people are not treated the same when they go before the courts. They get, tend to get longer, black and brown people get longer sentences for the same crime. Uh, there's targeting by police in terms of uh, certain communities where, you know, you, you look at marijuana, for example, uh, the usage is the same in terms of the black and white community, but arrests for marijuana are three times higher for blacks than they are for whites. So to me, that is targeting. Uh, you know, it's conscious targeting of people. Uh, you know, uh, but there's always been an attempt to marginalize people. Uh, I, think, I think you're going to ask a question about the new Jim Crow. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll wait then because I have something for, for that. Yeah, thanks for queuing me up. <laughs> Yeah. In, in her book, The New Jim Crow. Okay, segue. Michelle Alexander writes that the United States imprisons a larger percentage of its black population than South Africa did at the height of apartheid. So how do we get to that point? And, uh, and again, what can we do about it now? All right, well, this is an excerpt from The New Jim Crow. It's only a couple of paragraphs, if, if, uh, if I can just, if you could just bear with me. Um, Michelle Alexander says, um, it's an excerpt from the introduction. She says, Jarvius Cotton cannot vote. Like his father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and great-great-grandfather, he has been denied the right to participate in our electoral democracy. Cotton's family tree tells the story of several generations of black men who were born in the United States but who were denied the most basic freedom that democracy promises, the freedom to vote for those who will make the rules and laws that govern one's life. Cotton's great-great-grandfather could not vote as a slave. His great-grandfather was beaten to death by the Ku Klux Klan for attempting to vote. His grandfather was prevented from voting by Klan intimidation. His father was barred from voting by poll taxes and literacy tests. Today, Jarvius Cotton cannot vote because he, like many black men in the United States, has been labeled a felon and is currently on parole. 
so she argues that you know this whole criminalization of black men is a new way of being racist you know you can't say well i'm going to you know deny you health and housing and education because you're black but i certainly can if i say you're a criminal or you're an ex-felon you know i'm not i'm not racist that's you're a felon you can't get housing educate you can't get anything because you're a criminal so you know it's a new way of you're black and in terms of what to do about it the governor governor mondo has created a justice reinvention working group to suggest changes in the law and policy uh regarding rhode island's criminal justice system so what is the number one thing you want to see come out of that well and i, and I was on that panel um i guess the main thing that i think that the group wanted was the re reduction of parole i mean not parole but probation uh probations in rhode island are amongst the longest in the country all right so what are we third or i think we're the third, third we have the third longest probations in the country and, and, and i guess there are reasons why we do it that way but there's a sense that it's not working and it needs to be shortened you know and and, and they're, they're 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 working on it you know but but i i'd like to see uh more black and, and and latino and asian and native american judges we have a problem with representation in this state you know we have 90 magistrates and, and and judges in rhode island roughly 90 maybe 89 or whatever but we only have four magistrates and judges of color in this whole state four and and you know what we call that in boston disgraceful that's disgraceful you have an Hispanic judge uh, in the district court. You have a black judge in the Supreme, I mean the Superior Court, never been a black judge in the Supreme Court, or even or family court, or uh, workman compensation court in the history of those courts. But you don't, you have one in the Superior Court, you have a black person that's uh, a judge in the district court, and you have a black magistrate, and I think he's in uh, family court. And that's it. So we, we don't, I mean, this state is 25% of people of color at a minimum, maybe 30%, and growing. And yet, our representation in terms of the judiciary is like non-existent. So that's a problem. That's a problem. It's the same thing in terms of uh, the Attorney General's office. You know, I think he has 90 different uh, prosecutors or attorneys. Three or four people of color, three attorneys of color. You know, I mean, you know, you gotta do some outreach you know, there's a school in Boston called Boston University Law School. There's a Columbia Law School. Visit those places. Yeah, that, you're you talking know. about the pipeline, right? Because when pipeline. we had Governor Raimondo in to talk about the Race Rhode Island series, she said, well, I've got a, the two lists she had in front of her, there weren't any uh, people of color on the list. And she said, I've got to have, I, I'm trying to encourage more uh, diversity in the pipeline. So what's the key to doing that? Well, the key is to get people to believe that it's, it, it's worth their while. I mean, people are so frustrated in terms of the process because there has always been a pipeline that people feel that, why bother? It's, it's going to go to somebody else. Is, there, is it because of the perception is that it's a, it's a know-a-guy state and, you, and I don't know a guy? That's part of it. That, that's, that's definitely part of it. You know, and if you look at who becomes a magistrate or and a judge, uh, you know, I, I think that there's some people that would agree. That's part of it. Not all of it, of course, because I don't want to you know, denigrate a whole group of people. You know, it's not all of that. Everybody's qualified. But, you know, clearly, you know, um, you know, you have people that would like to be judges. And, and I think we need to take it seriously. Uh, we have to look at the judicial nominating panel. We have to look at other panels that may, might be out of the control of the, uh, the, um, the Supreme Court uh, chief judge. And we have to make sure that they're reflective of not just diversity of, of skin color, but diversity of thought. I told the chief judge of the Supreme Court, look, you know, you don't have to have a, somebody who looks like me on the traffic tribunal panel that overlooked a, a, a person that I thought was eminently qualified to be a magistrate. You know, that person looked like me. You could have a six foot, 10 foot white guy like David Logan, or the former dean of the Roger Room Law School. He'd be fine to be on anybody's panel because he's looking to make the state more inclusive. We need people on that JNC that understand that we don't have that and you need to look at that. And when you have a person of color that is eminently qualified, you can't pass them over for any reason. For any reason, I don't care how well connected your friends are, you, we can't do that anymore. We have to put our best team on the field, and right now we're not doing that. And do you have a, a you know, minor on how much diversity there are in the current field of candidates for the, this four, I think there's four other uh, vacancies? Uh, I'm not sure. I know there was uh, somebody uh, that didn't get, that was one vote short of uh, moving on to the governor. Uh, that actually was the same person that got denied the traffic tribunal. 
you know, I think this person, uh, you know, is eminently qualified. I mean, everybody agrees to it, you know, and um, it's just a shame uh, what we do to people here in this state that, that are qualified. You're talking about Boston. On February 22nd, the Boston Globe reported that the Boston branch of the NAACP had called for ousting Boston Latin School's headmaster for failing to adequately respond to racially charged incidents at that school and on social media. In one incident, a male student called a black female student a racial slur and threatened her with a reference to lynching. So while the administrators disciplined the, the male student, uh, they didn't notify the, his parents or the of the parents of the, of the female student. So what's the takeaway from this episode for administrators everywhere, including Rhode Island? Well, that administrator clearly was totally insensitive to the issue. I mean, given those facts, I mean, why wouldn't you take it very seriously? Why wouldn't you inform the parents? Why wouldn't you take action? Uh, Boston Latin is the flagship uh, public school in Boston. It's, uh, it's an exam school. I uh, went to the other exam school, Boston Technical High School. So, you know, it has a certain image in the city. and. You, you just can't have that kind of stuff go on. You've got to deal with it decisively. You can't look the other way and, 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 and imagine it's going to go away. You know, if there's a problem, you know, on that, uh, in that school, then you've got to take care of it. So that's why, and when the, the person didn't and looked like they weren't interested in taking care of it, I guess, because I'm not there, I, I think that's when my counterpart in Boston um, at the NAACP asked for their um, uh, termination. Uh, some in Rhode Island, including uh, some uh, members of the audience, have called for a constitutional amendment that would guarantee every student a right to a high-quality public education. Do you agree with that idea, or if not, what do you think is the main thing we need to do to better serve students in our urban schools? Well, on its face, it sounds reasonable, you know, to me. I mean, you know, how, how can you be against something like that? I mean, unless I'm missing something, you know, uh, it sounds reasonable. And I know there's a group of people that are trying to make that happen. Uh, matter of fact, they met with me uh, about a week ago uh, at... Uh, NAACP general body meeting. Uh, so I'm aware of that. Um, but we need to do just so much to try to bring everybody, you know, up to par, you know, and we have to, we can't be in denial. 40% of the public school students in Rhode Island are students of color, 40% and growing. And, I, and, you know, businesses come into a state because there's a trained, educated, and motivated labor force. So if you think you can ignore 40% of anything, and have a desirable result, and you're kidding yourself. They're gonna to go to Massachusetts, Connecticut, and wherever else. So it's in all of our interests to work together to make sure that we do what we need to do in terms of educating everybody so that businesses would look at Rhode Island as being attractive in terms of the labor force that they need. So then when they, the discussion comes to taxes, at least there is a discussion as opposed to no discussion at all because we don't have the labor force that, that, that is required. Just as I was coming over here today, I saw a headline that said nearly 20% of Donald Trump's supporters disapprove of Lincoln's, Lincoln's freeing the slaves. Uh, uh, you That's go all? Just 20%? <laughs> a YouGov economist poll in January asked respondents if they approved or disapproved of the executive order that freed all slaves in the states that were in rebellion against the federal government. That's otherwise known as the Emancipation Proclamation. 13% of respondents and nearly 20 uh, percent of Trump supporters uh, compared to 5 percent of Rubio said they disapproved of it, but it gets worse. 17 percent uh, said, uh, additional 13, 17 percent said they weren't sure. So what does this tell us about Trump supporters and this year's race? Well, um, you know, I don't want to talk too much with, about the likely Republican nominee. I don't want to too much about, about him, but since you asked me the question, it's really sad. It's a sad state of affairs in America where, you know, you have 20% uh, that, that feel that the Emancipation Proclamation was a bad idea, that maybe that I, people like, look like me should be slaves in this country just because of the way, way we look, and they be actually believe that and are willing to tell somebody that, 20%. I'm surprised it's that low, you know, and I'm sure that, and I've seen studies of, uh, of other groups that say that 70% believe that uh, President Obama is a Muslim. The, uh, Seventy percent believe that he's from Kenya. I mean, you you have people that actually do believe that, and they live in the United States, and they are of voting age. So be 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 aware of that. You know, you have people that might not, you know, you might not think, you know, think like this, but they do. You know, and uh, he's tapped into something. He's tapped into some anger, and uh, they have certain beliefs, and it's combustible, and. Uh, Wait and see. We're going to have to put on our seatbelts because it's going to be a hell of a ride. 
in danger of going over my 20 question limit. So one final question. What is the number one thing we can do walking out of the Providence Public Library tonight uh, to address the matters of equality and justice we've been talking about? Well, the number one thing for me is always the great equalizer, education. We've got to get it right in terms of our kids. Uh, they're up against it. They're not getting the education that they deserve in Rhode Island. Uh, I think the education system here is much worse than we think it is. Uh, you know, and I'm from the Boston. The Boston public schools, uh, and, and I, you know, I came from an era, uh, I think I was in the 10th grade, Jonathan Kozol wrote a book, Death at an Early Age, The Destruction of the Hearts and Minds of the Negro Children of the Boston Public Schools. I come from that Boston Public Schools, and I heard in terms of the park exam that the students in Boston outperformed the students in Rhode Island on the park exam. And I know that, you know, my high school, I think, might be 80% uh, people of color, a lot of them single-parent households, uh, you know, uh, public assistance. I, I don't think there's a, there was a high school in Rhode Island that outperformed my high school. You know, not one. And uh, that, that just shows you when you put apples to apples, just where we're at, you know. And that's just Massachusetts right over the border. So we have a lot of work to do for all the students, not just students of color. And we better get busy because it's a lot worse than we think it is. And we, we can pretend that, you know, we have, it's okay and point to certain successes. And those successes are legitimate. But overall, you know, we have a major problem here. And that 40% number is going to go up, students of color. So we better do something. We better do something fast because we can't, we can't have economic development unless we have people that can do the job. So it's in all our interest to, to make sure that we, um, you know, educate our kids in, in, in a way that they deserve. So just another reminder, the exhibit is open until 8.30 tonight. It's here till Sunday. I highly recommend it. And now I'm sure you've been uh, coming up with some hard questions for Jim here. Come on up to the microphone and fire away. Okay, not, I know there's about 10 people at least. Don't be shy. We'll get the Providence City Council coming to the, to the fore. <laughs> Providence branch of the NAACP. Um, it seems as if your profile's gone up in the last couple of years, and some of it is because we have more awareness from uh, the media, the Providence Journal covered the area. Um, and I'd like you to talk about, you know, has that, is that actually true? Is more going on? Um, is that a good thing or a bad thing? How much of it is uh, being part of progress, uh, you know, playing offense? How much of it is responding to problems? playing defense. If you just give us an overview of the state of the NAACP right now, the well, Providence branch. Well, thanks for asking the question, uh, Sam. Um, it's a little bit of, uh, of, of, of both. Um, I'm, I'm really friendly with the media. You know, I think the, the media, you know, are good people, you know, so I, I, I try to forge a positive relationship with all media, print and, and television, radio, uh, you name it. I think it's just, it's better to, to, to have those relationships. So uh, that's part of our profile going up. The other thing is that you know we, when your profile goes up, you get more calls. Uh, people tend to know who you are, and they 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 want help, especially in terms of employment discrimination. Most of our calls are of that nature, and they feel that we can do something about it, or we can be their advocate, or, you know, use the bully pulpit. So so I don't know if things are getting that much worse than they were, let's say, five years ago. I haven't done a study or a poll or whatever, but it, it, you know, it's steady. We get calls to the office every day. I get at least one to two calls every single day about somebody feeling they were discriminated against in the state of Rhode Island. Every day. So I'm not saying that that's better or worse than it was five years ago. I know what it is today. Can I have another question since no one is? Okay. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you, this, this exhibit, I was only seven years old in 1965, but in addition to seeing what was accomplished back then, there was this sense of progress. And it, it just seemed as if uh, we, were, we were heading on a path where we were going to solve a lot of problems. Um, and now, you know, in the last year or two, uh, it's a Black Lives Matter. It's not, it's not about victories. And you have some thinkers, uh, I'm thinking of ta Coates, who say, you know, it's just, it's just not some problems that we can solve. 
Um, and maybe you could just share some thoughts about how you view that and how it's viewed within uh, the NAACP. Well, you know, obviously uh, the rolling back of things like the Voting Rights Act and, uh, you know, the, all the incidents in terms of police community where you have all these unarmed young black men being uh, killed by law enforcement under the most questionable circumstances imaginable is a concern. But we're living in a, in a, in a, in a, in a global economy where the middle class is being squeezed uh, and, and people are anxious. And we know that, and we know that they're also anxious in terms of the diversification of this country. And we know that that was punctuated in 2008 by the election of President Barack Obama. So there's a lot of things going on, and people are very, uh, they're very anxious. Uh, you know, the economy, the, the diversity, I mean, a lot of these things are, have people really uptight. So things, people are acting out and doing things and out of anxiety, fear, bias racism, a little bit of everything. So we're living in a different time. I do get a sense that we're kind of going backwards myself uh, because of all these incidents that remind me of years ago. So hopefully we can get it, get it, back, get it, get it right because uh, we can't continue like this as a nation. Well, keep up the good work and thank you very thank much. You, and if I could follow up on his follow-up question. Uh, what, what, uh, it's a, you know, it's an organization more than 100 years old. What, and I saw at the annual meeting there was a big emphasis on trying to engage with young people so what, what's being done in that regard? Well, thanks for that question. Um, the NAACP is over 100 years old, and, and the inside joke is that, oh, uh, we got some new members. Oh, we got some people under 50? <laughs> and I, when I first heard that joke, I kind of laughed, but then I said, you know what? There's too much truth to that joke. I looked around at the national convention, and there was too many people that looked like me. And I'm not talking about my skin color. I'm talking about, you know, gray and bald and, you know look like me age-wise, and I said, you know, we can't sustain ourselves as an organization, you know, with everybody being in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. Just, that, that dog won't hunt. So we need to have younger people. So I've doubled and tripled down on that. Uh, in New England, we have 16 different branches. We have, we had one high school branch. Now we're going to have like four. Three of them are going to be in Providence. One in Boston. So we're going to, my goal is to have 80% or 90% of all the high school branches in New England, all the college branches in New England, to have the most vibrant youth council in New England, if not one of the most vibrant in the country. And I think I'm well on my way. I'm doubling down on the youth. Uh, half my executive committee is under 35. I have about 25% of them are under 30, uh, which is definitely atypical of the NAACP. I'm r rushing to the other, other side in terms of youth. And I just think that it needs to happen uh, in terms of our sustainability. It needs to happen in terms of people understanding what's going on with civil rights at a young age. We're even tr trying to form a uh, junior high school chapter. So, yeah, I think uh, that's the way to go, and that's what we're doing. Uh, Jim, thanks a lot. I really appreciate your perspective on this stuff. Now I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Okay. Um, you were referencing the sort of discriminatory disc discriminatory practices around marijuana use and those kinds of things uh, with folks of color. And I, I just curious if you're willing to make a statement or a stand about the legalization of marijuana and the treatment of it more like alcohol, you know, and regulated in those terms, and if you think that's a move in the right direction around some of this stuff. Well, uh, I'm on the record as being in favor of uh, the legalization of marijuana. And, and I, I'm on record of being in favor of it because it's a social justice issue. I mean, it's a lot, it's, it's different issues to different people. I mean, it's a medicinal, you know, uh, issue. It's also an issue in terms of raising taxes. All legitimate, you know, in terms of talking points and issues. But I look at it as a social justice issue. It is tearing apart our community. This whole thing of incarceration for marijuana uh, is hurting the individual, the family, the community. We can't, you know, this war on drug, we can't, our community can't, withstand it any longer. You know, it, it didn't work, it's not working, and all it's done is creating that criminal class so people are not being discriminated so much now, well, actually they are, but in terms of race, but, but now that they're, if they're a criminal, then people can say, we, we don't have to give you a job, we don't have to give you housing, we don't have to give you health care, or whatever, because of uh, the fact that uh, you're a criminal. It just, it's just too heavy a burden uh, to carry in this country, so if we can uh, regulate it for adults 21 and over, uh, then I think that uh, it'll, it'll, be, it'll help have less people in our community have that 
that that uh, criminal label and i think having less uh, it'll, it'll be better for our, our community hope i answered that right jim how are you hey. scott wolf oh, from of Gross harbor island i know scott good thanks um couple observations uh, i'm old enough to uh have been very affected by the turmoil of the 60s and the progress of the 60s. My dear mother took me to a fair housing hearing at the State House in 1964 when I was 11 years old. So uh, I, I think there been a lot, there's been a lot of progress as well as a lot of continuing challenges, huge continuing challenges. Two things I'm noticing that give me some hope, and I like to focus on the hopeful side of things, are the relatively tolerant attitudes of our young people, regardless of their race, about racial issues uh, and about social issues generally, and the increasing amount of interracial dating and interracial marriage. Are these things that augur well, do you think, for our future, despite all the challenges of education and discrimination, and, uh, or do you think that these people are gonna become grumpy old Trump supporters when they get to be 50 or 60 years old? Well, we'll have to wait and see how they are. Uh, if you remember, uh, we used to have a saying on campus uh, when I was in school and when you were in school, don't trust anybody over 30. Right, right. Remember that expression? I do, but I tried, <laughs> I, I've repressed it. <laughs> For the last 30 years, I've repressed it. <laughs> right. You remember our saying, don't trust anybody over 30. So we don't know what happens when people get older. But I think it does bode well for us as a nation that you have that kind of tolerance and you have that kind of openness about people of different races, different genders, different sexual orientation, different religions. Of course it's better, you know? Yeah. And that's why it hurts so bad when I hear about things at Boston Latin, Providence College, uh, and uh, Missouri. Uh, because I think of millennials of being better than us baby boomers in terms of race. Yeah. And so when you, you see that stuff, you, you're hoping it's an aberration. You know, but then you, you look at Charleston, South Carolina, and the nine people that were gunned down. Yeah. They were gunned down by a 21-year-old. Yeah. You know, that's a millennial. I mean, it wasn't some grumpy old white person right. that was wearing a hood. Yeah. Okay, it was a 21-year-old that was fairly well educated and uh, had uh, done his research over time. So he wasn't crazy as people would try to make him out to be. Yeah. It was planned. Yeah. So uh, you know, um, I'm I'm I. I'm hopeful. Yeah. I see all the signs that things are going to get better in general. Hopefully they can run for office and be in the legislature and, and change things uh, in terms of uh, the, our country and, uh, and, and, and do the kinds of things that we need. But right now, we're at loggerheads. Amen. Not, and we can't, we can't wait for progress. We've we got to make it happen. We've got to make it happen. We've got to make it happen. And you're right. We don't have the luxury of time to wait 10 years uh, for them to, to now be fully in control of things. Uh, we, right. we have to have it now. And uh, so I'm a little pessimistic uh, because of the way things have gone, especially over the last couple of years with uh, all the uh, unarmed young black men being uh, killed under the most questionable circumstances by law enforcement. That certainly is um, very, very disheartening to me. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, who's, who's next? Hi, as a segue to your last comment, um, much of the trauma we've experienced in the United States has been because of the police community affairs and young black men being murdered. What have you done with you, Clemens, and the community to help Providence see our way through all these tensions, specifically with police and youth? Good, good question. Um, I have the police chief of Providence and the state colonel of Rhode Island, I have on speed dial on my phone, and they have me on their speed dial. We communicate a lot together. Uh, there's a lot of meetings between law enforcement and not just the NAACP, but a lot of other community groups. Uh, there's been a there's been a um, acceptance that that community involvement by law enforcement has to happen in Rhode Island. So I give them fairly high grades, especially the command staffs here in Rhode Island. Uh, I've had at least 10 police chiefs want to come on my show because they they uh, have openings for new officers and they want to make sure that everybody knows, so I'm encouraged. Uh, so I think here there's open lines of communication, at least in terms of the command staff and then the chiefs and the uh, the colonel, colonels uh, and the commissioner, Commissioner Parry. 
so that I think that's helpful, and 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 you know they, there's a lot of coming to each other's forums and academies and whatever, so a lot of communication, which is always good. Um, however, um, in terms of the rank and file, it doesn't always filter down that that far. There are still people that probably should not be police officers. I'm not saying they're bad people; they're just not suited to wear the uniform, to wear that badge, to have that gun. They're not they're not they're not suited to be there. They just are not made to be a police officer. They don't have the temperament. Uh, to, in terms of uh, being in diverse situations. So um, we just have to do a better job of making sure that people that should not be a police officer don't ever get a chance to. And those that are police officers that don't do the right thing, we have to make sure that they can no longer put our communities in danger. Uh, they have to go. And, uh, and the police chiefs know that. They say they, the Policeman's Bill of Rights is the issue. And I you know, can't disagree with that. And, so we have to do something to make sure that, you know, the police know, look, this person that's racially profiling, you know, is not helping your department. Because the community looks at all of you as bigots, you know. You want this guy that's going to put your life in jeopardy to keep his job? You should be helping me to get rid of this guy. He's hurting your department, the reputation. He's putting your life in jeopardy. And you want to protect this guy? Why? I mean, this is a, this is a thin blue wall or a blue, blue whatever, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't, extend to a bad apple or bad apples that don't understand that, you know, police work depends mostly on community police relations and tips and, 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 and being able to work well together so that you can solve crime. And when a community, you know, retrenches and doesn't want to deal with you because they're afraid of you and they see you as an occupier, then it's going to be harder to solve crime. You're a police officer to solve crime. That's your job. So anything that makes it harder, you know, you should root out. So we, we have those discussions all the time. I think I think that's one reason why you don't have any bad incidents here in Rhode Island. Not yet. Hey Jim, how are you? How are you doing? Good. Um, uh, two two things real quickly. Um, I'm Don Mays from the uh, Roger Williams University Intercultural Center. And earlier you mentioned that you want to um, uh, bring more um, young people into um, the NAACP. And you talked about how it's important for the survival of the NAACP. Can you um, share a little bit with us about uh, why it's important for young people, you know, why it's, why it's relevant for young people. And also, second part is, um, I saw a picture of you with a group of young people at Bryant University. This is Roger Williams University. Got some young people up here, and you know, you're starting I'm, a chapter there, so. I want to start a chapter at every single school in Rhode Island. So I'm get, I'll get to Roger Williams. Uh, every, single, every single school in Rhode Island. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to skip over Roger Williams. Uh, you know, that's uh, that's not going to happen. I think right now we're at Providence College, we're at Brown, and we're we're moving. Uh, so, what can the kids get out of it? Well, we want to have kids, first of all, be involved in programming. You know, programs that you know take them to the White House, take them to the Schomburg Museum in New York. Those are the kinds of activities that we have our kids doing. Activities that they might not be able to do otherwise because their family doesn't have the wherewithal to do these kinds of things. Things that kids in other areas of the state get to do. We want to level the playing field so that our kids can do whatever any kid in Rhode Island to, to, can do, no matter how wealthy or how well to do. We want to level that playing field. So we want to give our kids that. And we also want to give them the idea of structure and, and organizations and, 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 and you know, we feel strongly about having a president, a vice president, treasurer of all our organizations, the high school level, college level, the youth council, all has presidents and they have executive committees and they have meetings and, and that's important because you're gonna have to live that life, you know, when you when you come out as an adult, so you might as well get to learn how to do it now. And you might even have an advantage over certain people because they're not doing doing it at that level. So so you know black history is 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 taught daily, twenty four seven, three hundred and sixty five days a year, as well as the history of other groups as well, people of color, others. You know, so we, you know, uh, feel that they're going to get a lot out of being a member of the NAACP by just what we do in our programming, and um, and it's a good thing. I mean, I know I was helped by groups uh, when I was a kid in Boston. There was the Harriet Tubman House, there was Morgan Memorial Youth and Children's Center, there was the South End House, and you know, Lord knows where I would be if I didn't have that kind of support after school growing up in Boston. So I know how important those groups can be because they helped me. All right, so right after this, we're going to meet in the back, okay? How's that? Hey, um, Angel, AS220 Youth. Um, 
I was really interested about uh, when you started talking about representation. Something that frustrates me is institutions talking about the need for diversity, yet um, I think there's a piece missing. So, um, because it's one thing to talk about diversity and inclusion, but like, what are you doing to ensure that it's like a part of, uh, like systematically a part of what you do? So I wanted to know if you could elaborate on that and if you've seen any um, institutions um, do it right in Rhode Island? Uh, well, um, there, well, there's one, uh, one, one organization uh, that, um, you know, I've run into that, um, that does a better job than most uh, organizations. But I don't want to name any organizations because, you know, I, I want to have a chance to work with each and every one of you. So I don't want to start putting certain groups on a pedestal or whatever. Every group can do better. Uh, and it comes from the top. It comes from the leadership. It comes from the president of an organization or a CEO. And it really depends on that person. If that person takes things seriously, it'll, it'll, it'll be done, it'll, be, it'll permeate downward. You know, and, and, and if that person hasn't bought into diversity and inclusion, then it won't. I mean, you have more HR directors that don't do a good job because they know that the CEO is not committed. The president's not committed. There needs to be more diversity at every college campus in terms of faculty, staff, across the board. Nobody has done a job where they can stop. But if the president of the university, if the CEO of a company doesn't demand that this is a business imperative, that our business is going to suffer unless we do this, uh, it won't happen. People are going to just fall back and not and do what they normally do, which is not much when it comes to diversity and inclusion. And, and, and inclusion is important because it should be part of the day-to-day. And I don't want people to just feel that because they have a certain amount of black and brown and red and yellow faces that, that that's the end of it, because it's not. There's retention, and there's that inclusion piece that people should feel valued, and they should feel uh, that uh, the, what, what they bring to the table is important. And, and, and all of that you know, has to be part of it. It's just not numbers, not, well, we have 10%, and we used to have 5%, so we're doing good. Well, you're doing better than you did in your, that one aspect, but it's multifaceted. You know, and, you, and the job is not done until people really feel comfortable in their space. And, and more often than not, they, pe people of color don't. You know, they, they have what they call the mask. You know, they have to play like everything is okay, but inside they're suffering, dying inside, because they're not being taken seriously. They're being overworked for promotions, uh, and they're more qualified than lesser people that, that yeah. tend to know people. That, that, that doesn't help anybody. You need the best people uh, to, to, to have a job or to, to move up, and that doesn't happen. Uh, you know, more often than not, uh, you know, people get overlooked, and it's just not helping anybody. And we just have to be honest about it. I, I, always, I always like to say that, you know, when people are trying to apply for a job, the average white person is assumed to be qualified unless proven otherwise. The average person of color is assumed to be not qualified unless proven otherwise. And I think that's pretty accurate, no matter who the HR person is. And even if the HR person is of color, I think it's still accurate. So uh, we, have to, we have to work. We have a lot of work to do. Jen, I know you, you know I'm going to call you and tell you what a wonderful job you did tonight, but I'll just say it publicly, uh, you always do a wonderful job um, representing the downtrodden. Well, and um, I happen to be a member of the NAACP, for those who may not know. Um, they, I'm not sure if it was a book or a movie or both, but there was an entity that one time said, uh, None dare call it treason. I'm sure you probably know whether it was a book or a movie. But I think somebody needs to write a book and call it None Dare Call It Racism. Because it just seems like we dance around that word so much. And I know this isn't a question. I guess the question is, is there a reason why, since we have finally elected an African-American president. And since we see so many racist things going on, uh, the, the, the gentleman who stood in the, uh, when the uh, uh, president was making the State of the Union message and, and, and yelled, you lie. He would have never done that had the president been a white, a Democrat or Republican. Um, I don't hear people calling the reasons why there's so much opposition to the president racist. 
And I wonder if, and the question is, do you think this is a, because I don't think it's by accident. Is this a good thing? Is this a strategy? Um, what should we do with it? Well, nobody wants to think of our country as being racist in 2016. I mean, I think most people, they don't want to, it's hard to acknowledge that. I mean, I think it's, it's you know, we've come so far, I mean, you know, it's almost like being in denial of sorts. You just don't want to believe that we still are not there yet, you know. Even with an African-American president, we still have all these problems. And in fact, there's been a backlash because, and I call it a blacklash, because we have an African-American president. Not everybody was happy with that election. There were some people that said it would never happen in their lifetime, and some of them were hopeful that it would never happen in their lifetime. You know, and they didn't, they didn't, and, they, and, they, and they, now they're seeing it. And, you know, as long as people, you know, being taken care of, that's one thing, but I don't want you to be my boss. You know, no, no, no that's, that's a little bit much. You know, and I think that certain people have a problem with people of color and authority, you know, people of color in charge. People, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a racist, but, you know, they're not comfortable with that whole notion and uh, brings out the worst of people. I think the diversification of America, this fear, you know, of, 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 of America being different than what they're used to, you know, they, they don't want change. They want to, they think that things are not great, but, you know, they, they kind of like the way America is. They, you got all these different kind of people that they never saw before and in positions, and they just feel that if a person, if, if this person gets this, then that means I'm losing something. They always think it's a zero-sum game. They never think of the pie getting bigger. Never. Or seldom. You know, and, and that's a problem, you know, because, you know, there's enough for everybody. You know, just because certain groups are getting what they should have had anyway, that doesn't mean you're going to, that doesn't mean they're taking from you. It's like, he's taking my job. There's no my job, your job. There's a job, you know, and we're going to create more jobs. So he doesn't have your job. There's this whole notion of entitlement, and that goes into white privilege, and, and I don't want to get into that because... You know, we've been here for a, for a while, but some people feel entitled. You know, they, they said, I, I should have this, you know, uh, and uh, there's no such thing as it, being entitled, you know, you gotta work for it. And um, to some people, it's, it's, it's just disconcerting, and I, I just think that they uh, don't even see what they do sometimes, you know, and some people do, but uh, it's, um, you know, with the economy being the way it is, I, I know that, you know, usually when things are good, things are, you know, you have less incidents of racism or whatever. Things are not good in the economy for the average American. For the top 1% or 5%, things are as good as they've ever been, ever, including the Gilded Age of the Robert Barons. Better than that, you know, never been better. But for the, uh, for the middle class, uh, things are worse than certainly in the last 40 years, and maybe ever, you know, since, you know, who knows when. So there's a lot of anxiety, economic anxiety. And when you have that, you know, People are saying, you know, I got my own problem to deal with. I, you know, I, don't, I can't deal with their problems, those people. I got my own thing you know, up against it. So there's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of demagoguery, you know. I'm not going to name any names, but, you know, uh, there's people that, you know, make a living off, 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 uh, of, uh, the, uh, of, of others not being as aware of their surroundings. They'll blame those people are the reason why you are in your situation. And those people will believe it. They'll believe that. You know, and uh, you see it every day, scapegoating. I know, I know this is my 21st question, but okay. um, it, you said dueling demonstrations of the State House. How, how do you think Rhode Island should uh, respond to the Syrian refugees? I think Rhode Island should take in the Syrian refugees. America has always taken in refugees. No question about it. I mean, it's like another one of those topics, you know, these people. I mean, what do you mean, these people? You know, we once in this country in the 40s, there was a boatload of people that we said, well, now you got to go back. You got to go back. We can't, we can't take you in. We got to go back. And those people were Jewish in the, during the war. And they were turned back to who knows what. I don't want to relive that episode in my lifetime. That was before my lifetime. But hearing about a boatload of Jewish refugees fleeing Nazi Germany being turned back by Americans to me is unbelievable. Just thinking about us in terms of who we're supposed to be. So for us to trim back anybody that's fleeing oppression and persecution, you know, thinking people, I'm sure, agree with me, but others, you know, they'll listen to the demagogues and they'll, they'll blame, 
you know, the refugees for all their problems. I, got, I'm, I'm, I have a cold today. It must be the refugees. I mean, whatever. My, my kid can't get braces. It must be the refugees. And, and they believe that. And that's the problem. You know, uh, there are too many people that are just not as aware of what's going on that we would like. And they're prone to believe anything and do anything. Hi, my name is Charlene. I also work at AS220 Youth. Um, going off what you were talking about is um, people taking advantage of people who are less aware. Um, one thing that's been on my mind recently is the um, idea of net neutrality um, and the different um, the bills that are being thought about. What's your opinion on that argument right now? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm familiar. Net neutrality? Um, the idea that the internet can be regulated so that people who pay more money can have access to the full internet, whereas people who pay less internet can be have access to some type of a filtered internet. No, I'm, I'm, you know, I haven't really thought about it, but I, you know, I, I want people to have full access of the internet regardless. You know, I, I can't. I can't uh, I'm always more in favor of inclusion and, and, and those kinds of things. So without even having really looked at that. I wouldn't want uh, anybody, uh, to, because of the ability to pay, to have less access to, to something like that. I wouldn't be in favor of restricting it, uh, internet access. I'm not quite sure if I understand the issue totally, but from on its face, it seems like it, it, it would not be a good thing. I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah. Open it up. Um, <clears throat> hi. Uh, actually, I just wanted to go to uh, your comment about the refugees, since you mentioned it. I just read the newspapers today that Canada has announced that by the end of the year, they'll take in 50,000 refugees. So, I know, it's interesting, our neighbors to the north. Um, I, I was interested in asking a question um, that I've just recently become aware of. I've been reading some stuff around the term diversity, and it seems a little like semantics, but they're making some very compelling arguments around the way the term diversity has been appropriated where everyone now represents themselves as being diverse. So for example, um, <clears throat> recently on, on, on television, uh, you had at Congress, uh, I can't remember what it was in relation to, but you had a, you know, a bunch of congressmen come forward and, and the gentleman said, can you imagine a more diverse group? And it was, it was very peculiar to, to see you know, what struck those people as a bunch of middle-aged white men and he had some version of diversity as being present. And the argument is being made that everyone is sort of claiming um, diversity because it's easy to sort of um, have a few representatives of different groups and kind of imagine yourself as diverse. So here's what they're, they're talking about. They're saying that we need to think about uh, using terms like equity, which have a social justice component and demands us thinking about social justice uh, in a way that, you know, yeah, anyway, I wondered if you could comment on that a little bit, if you've had yeah. a chance to think about it. Yeah, well, I, I would be more in favor of that as well, you know, uh, you know equity uh, as opposed to diversity. Because too often, you know, that term is used. We have diversity in our department. You know, we have, uh, we have the one Latina. We have the one African-American male. We have diversity. Yeah, but you have 100 people in this department. <laughs> I mean, what are you talking about? You know, you know no. You know, you, you know, and diversity actually means a lot of things. And that, it's not just ethnicity. It's just not gender. It's... it's thought, it's, it's whatever, so I, I get it in terms of, you know, with the, the big D, diversity, but, um, you know, just, you know, using that word and, 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 and having numbers of people and, and, and not thinking about the inclusion and equity and all that as being part of it, to me, is just being dishonest. So, you know, if you really want to truly have a diverse unit or workplace or whatever, you know, you need to see people at all levels, not just at the lower level. You need to see them at the top level. Uh, you need to see people that you know uh, can can fully exploit their talents and skills in a way that you know is conducive to 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 helping the company or the agency or the institution. Uh, you know, because more often than not, uh, you know things on paper look diverse, but the people are marginalized. They're 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 not uh, not considered seriously. Uh, it, it it it's it's not an honest you know effort in terms of the term diversity for a workplace or, a, or an environment. So, you know, equity to me would be better because it's more what I'm trying to get across. And, uh, you know, maybe sometimes words get so used for a while that it do, they do change meanings. But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we all can do better with diversity. I mean, Rhode Island, you know, I, I, I named the numbers of judges. I talked about the 
number of, of, of attorneys in the Attorney General's office. I mean, uh, you could uh, look at the, the number of teachers in our public schools. I think only maybe 20% at the most of color. We gotta do a lot better than that. We gotta do a lot better than that. And I know that I need help in that effort, and I will. But, um, you know, too, more often than not, there's no diversity in a lot of areas in Rhode Island. It just isn't. I go to meetings all the time, and I'm the only person of color out of 50 people. I go to meetings a lot. Only one color, 50 people in Rhode Island. You know, I don't know how that could that could, that that can happen, but it happens. And I think people in the room are oblivious to it. Everybody in that room should say, Rhode Island's 25%, maybe a third of color. I'm in a room with 30 people, and there's only one person, maybe no people of color in here. Something something's wrong because we're trying to plan for the whole state. They should be asking the question. You know, what's what's wrong with this picture? Uh, because if they don't, nothing will ever change. Yes. Hello, my name is Ashley Sanchez. I work with Bank of America. And um, I know why well, I was here a few minutes late, so I'm not sure if this is a topic that you touched upon, but um, I think a lot has of the issues that we're having has to do with the community. It takes a community to raise a child, and I don't think there's no, and there's any union in the communities. And like me growing up thinking when I was 11, 12, and my brothers now growing up, it's a totally different atmosphere. So what are we doing to change that? Well, I don't know if we could ever have the kind of communities we, we had. I remember growing up in the south end of Boston. It was, uh, it was the poorest community in the city, but, but we never thought of ourselves as being poor because we, we, we all looked out for each other. You know, we, we kind of had parents that raised each other's kids. <laughs> you know, we, you know, nobody had a lock on their door. You know, it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a community in the best sense. Uh, very few people moved. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, jobs seemed to be more stable, I guess, to a certain extent, uh, in terms of people being able to work one job for 30, 40 years. So um, I don't think we'll ever get back to that. So we have to manage the new, the new normal. And um, we just have to respect each other more, you know, and just care for each other more. And uh, so try to understand each other, you know, and not be so easy to point the finger at, at somebody in terms of uh, you know, that's different, you know, and not trying to understand them. Um, there's no easy answer to that. It's just that we just have to be more tolerant of each other and understand that we're all here together. We, we can, if we all pull together, you know, and then Rhode Island will make it a great state, but if we're all blaming each other for this, that, and the other, and, and thinking that this person's taken from me and that person doesn't deserve it because he doesn't know my cousin or my uncle, or, that all this madness has to end. It really has to end. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for being here and for your, um, for your dedication um, to, towards, towards the effort. Uh, my name is Adrian Abner. I'm a law student at uh, Roger Williams. So um, I'm kind of like a little transplant here for, for a few years. Uh, my question is, is, what collaboration is being done with the faith-based uh, agencies, the churches, mosques? Uh, bec because this whole issue with racism, um, not having inclusion, diversity, or whatever. It's a hard issue. Uh, and until we change our minds, until our hearts are changed, all of these other things are only going to be Band-Aids. So I'm just, I'm just wondering, what, what is the collaboration that's being done with faith-based um, institutions? Um, a lot of collaboration. Um, I work uh, closely with the Council of Churches. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of you know Reverend Don Anderson. So I work with him. Uh, you know, one of the one of the issues that came up recently was the whole thing about Muslims and and, and how they were being treated in the state. And so we work with Farid Ansari of uh, the Muslim community community. And uh, there was a couple of different sessions to help people understand. Um, I've been involved in a lot of uh, there's been some church services to, in terms of tolerance that the NAACP has worked with uh, different ministers on. There's a ministry alliance that I I I, I like to work war with that that historically has been here in Rhode Island. So I realize that, you know, it is important to 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 work with the religious community or the faith community. And NAACP has always understood that in, in our history. And you have those alliances, you know, uh, Martin Luther King coming out of the church working with Roy Wilkins of the NAACP, for example. So there's always been that. And uh, 
So I understand that in order for me to be as good as I can be, I need to work with people that are in the faith community as well as other communities to work collaboratively to solve these tough and thorny problems. So yes, you're right. You know, you got to change people's hearts and minds before you change anything. Because if they don't want to do it, they're not going to do it. Any other questions? I have one. <clears throat> right now, you talked about some of the laws that were recently changed, and one of them, one of the laws I, I often think about is Brown versus Board of Education. Now, you said that separate but equal is not fair. When you think about it, we fund our schools based upon our taxes and taxing that community. So then, in turn, what you have is a, a lower income community getting less funding getting less education, which in turn feeds into the problem of the prison system. And now prison's a big business. Like, it's not like we're incarcerating individuals. We're incarcerating them and working them. They're actually doing, working for large companies while they're in prison. And that's a tremendous workforce that these companies have right now that they're not paying a lot of money for. Are they going to be willing for you to reverse that cycle so that that workforce now becomes a paid workforce that has voting rights, that can make a union, that can do all these things and make those people actually people instead of just laborers. Well, Michelle Alexander, the new Jim Crow, says all this is by design. It's all by design. This whole mass incarceration is to almost re-enslave the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of slaves. It's just a legitimate way to do it. So, yeah, we, we can't support a system like that. Uh, that's lunacy, you know. Uh, that, that's uh, it's transparent in terms of what's going on with with that kind of system where they actually exploit prisoners, you know. That, you know, it's it's the new slavery. It is the new Jim Crow. But uh, getting back to the, the original point in terms of the schools, uh, you know, Rhode Island and I, and I was a part of that uh, funding formula. We, we we just have to do a better job in terms of not just you know making sure that we 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 don't forget the most vulnerable. I know we have English language learners and we have the disabled and we have uh, people that. You know, in vocab, we have to make sure that you know, if, if, if we need more resources, then we have to spend more resources. I mean, that's where the constitutional uh, issue comes in, you know, to make sure that there's more resources to educate our kids. Because if we don't, then we're not going anywhere. And if we don't do it fairly, we're not going anywhere. Forty percent of the public school students are students of color. So if we think we can marginalize a group based on color and still be a great state, a 40 percent group, you know, I, I just don't know how, how smart you are if you think that, that's logical, that can actually work. That's not going to work. That, that, does not, that math does not work. You've got to do something or else the state's not going anywhere, period. Businesses are telling you that every day. Believe them. Believe them. Okay, they're not coming because you don't have the trained, educated, motivated labor force. You have too many people of color and others that don't have the skills. So, you know, you don't believe them. They'll keep going to Massachusetts and Connecticut. Believe them. And do the right thing and educate everybody and feel it, treat everybody equally. You know? So uh, if we don't get it right, then we'll all be suffering, all of us. We're inextricably linked here in this state. It affects each and every one of us. The taxpayer is paying $60,000 a year at the ACI per, per MA on average. That's taxpayer's money. That's, not, I'm not, that's me. That's you, the taxpayer. I can't afford it. I don't want it. Most of the people suffer from addiction. Let's take $20,000 and put them in drug treatment programs and lower to recidivism. I don't want to pay $60,000. I'm a taxpayer. I don't want it. I can't take it. I'm conservative, okay? I don't want it. It's too much money. Close it down. Close that system down. Close the ACI down. It's, not, it's taking too much of my tax dollars. I don't want it. So maybe this is a good time to say thanks very much to our, our speakers, Ed and Jim, for what certainly was an interesting conversation. Thank you again for coming. Let's uh, say thanks.